Hi, I'm Luzan Anti. I'm the lead pastor here at Victory Church in Sharon. I want to thank you for watching our sermon video today. And I want to encourage you that if you live in the area and you don't have a home church of your own, please come and be our guest some Sunday. You can get all of our information online at www.victory-ag.com. We'll see you soon. Um, after worship one Sunday, a little boy came up to his preacher out at the door and the the little boy looked at the pastor, and the pastor shook his hand, and the, pa the little boy said, Pastor, when I grow up, I'm going to give you a lot of money. And the pastor said, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate about that, but, but why? He said, because my daddy says you're one of the poorest preachers he's ever heard. <laughs> this morning, we're starting a new teaching series entitled The Generous Life. You know, um, I actually have, each one of you should have received coming in the door a handout that you can actually take notes and fill some fill in the blanks, a little worksheet for you. They are so generous. Oh, what a big heart they have. Isn't that something that every one of us would love to be said about us, right? But if we're honest, living generously can be a challenge in our fast-paced, self-absorbed culture. And what is true generosity anyways? During this teaching series, we're going to look at what the Bible says about what it means to live a generous life. This morning, I want us to discuss the issue and the topic of our responsibility to live a generous life. Living a generous life actually begins in your heart. You have to have the desire to live generously. And you have to have it so much that you will establish disciplines in your life to be able to live and give generously. These disciplines are what we call, biblically, we call stewardship. Stewardship is being faithful with the resources that God has planted into your life. In the Bible, the uh, Bible times, a steward was someone who was in charge of uh, or managed the belongings of another individual. Like Joseph was the chief steward over Potiphar's house, and then later he became the chief steward over uh, the uh, pharaoh of Egypt, over the entire kingdom, really. The word for steward can be translated into two different words. The first is manager, the second is supervisor. A manager, a steward is someone who is a, a manager or a supervisor of the resources of somebody else. In scripture, the position of a steward is one of great responsibility. He or she is the supreme authority under the master and has full responsibility for all of the master's possessions and household affairs. Living a generous life starts by being faithful with all that God has given to you. In fact, a steward has really only one responsibility, and that is to be faithful. That's one, I think that's one of your fill in the blanks there. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says this in the King James Version. It says, now it is required that those who have been given a trust prove faithful. A steward needs to prove himself faithful. Before we can be faithful, though, we must know what is required of us to do. So often we, we view our stewardship merely as a financial thing. We've come to believe that all that God is asking for is our money. And so when anybody talks about stewardship, our mind naturally assumes that they're talking about the real issue is money. But money is only a part of stewardship, specifically the stewardship that you and I have. There's actually three things that we must steward in our lives. Our time, our treasures, and our talents. Our time, our treasures, and our talents. As a human being, you only have, think about this, of these three things, our time, our treasures, and our talents, you only have so much time. And your time is getting shorter every day. Is Christopher still in here? He's with the kids? Okay, is there uh, uh, Matt, come on up here, man. Come give me a hand. Quickly. And Miss Betty, would you give me a hand, too? I don't know where Miss Betty is. She's over here, okay. If you'll come, come on, Miss Betty. Matt, 
grab that end of that rope and hold that up for me. And Miss Betty, if you'll grab the other end of the rope and hold that up over there. Okay? Dominic, come on up here, man. Hold it up real tight. Hold it up real tight. So there you go. Perfect. Dominic, do me a favor. Position yourself. This is our timeline today, okay? I, I was planning on Chris being there at 10 years old or, you know, around 10 years old, but Matt, you'll just have to do. Just you can get on your knees. Where are you on this timeline? 20 years old, right around 20, 22 years old. You remember being 20, 22 years old, and you remember thinking, man, everything is in front of me, right? In fact, I remember being 10 years old and thinking, I can't wait to drive a car, right? And, but here's the problem. At 10 years old, I had to wait 16 years yet, or no, I had to wait 10, 10 years or whatever, six years to get a driver's license. Six years seems so long, right? Didn't it seem like it was so far away? And then, man, to be 25 years old and be moving out of the house, that even seemed even further. That's, that's 15 years away. Man, I just, I couldn't wait to get there. It seemed so far, right? Let me see. Uh, Sabrina, come on up here, would you? <laughs> come on up and take your, your place on the line, okay? And let me see. Uh, uh, how about... Uh, Sabrina, so she's right in between, what are we, 30 and 40, right? Closer to 30. Okay, that's her. She's holding on to 30 with all of her might. <laughs> uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. Uh, how about um, Bruce? Come on up. All right, come on up, Bruce. Bruce, no, I don't think he's going to come to 70. Boy, you took the long way around, brother. <laughs> Come on up. I think he's probably right around the middle here someplace, right? Now, even, even here being 50 years old, right? Right around 50. Wait a minute. Hold on. All right. Yeah, right around 50. See, for Sabrina, she's still, being 30, she still is like, man, there's a lot of time left. I got a lot of time left. Bruce, because <laughs> me and you... Me and you are about the same age, brother. And we still got a little time left, right? I mean, we got a little, yeah, but it, let me ask you a question. How long does six years seem to you now? Six years? Six years. Doesn't seem that long anymore, does it? 46 years doesn't seem long. No, okay, see, it. there you go. All right, let me see. Vinny, come on up here, brother. No, he's, 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 Yeah. Vinny, where are you, brother? Where are you on the timeline? <laughs> there he is, right around 70. Okay, there you go. And uh, let me see, where's Irene? I asked Irene to help, too. Come on up, Irene. And she's going to be someplace, I think, between, between Vinny and, and Miss Betty. And I'm not going to tell you how old Miss Betty is. But... Yeah, she's really close to the same car that she's the next to right there, all right? But she can run circles around you or I, right? I just want you to know that. Now, here's the thing. The older, older we get, the less time. And really, the more you realize that time is going quick. It doesn't last forever. Folks, the idea is this is that for you and I, we only have, the Bible actually says we might have 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Miss Betty, you've gone way beyond already what the Bible says. And we're not going to bring, we're not going to bring Ramon up, brother. 94, 90, 91, 91. So thank you guys. Give them a good hand clap right there. You can just set that right back down. I appreciate you guys helping me out here. See, there's an appreciation that comes as you age and you get older and you realize, I don't have the same time, the same amount of time that I did when I was young. 
And so I, I bring this to you because I want you to understand that every, every minute that you have, that's a gift that God has given to you. And God expects you to steward that time. What that means is that means that if, if time is getting shorter for me, I want to steward the time that God gives me properly. I don't want to waste time on things that don't matter to God or matter in his kingdom. In fact, I want to build margin into my, t- my life so that I can be available for God if he needs me. Some of us don't leave any extra time in our schedule to serve God. We leave time for vacation. We leave time for family. We t- leave time for sports. But when it comes to, to serving God, sorry, I had to work. Or sorry, that's my day off. In order to know what is the best use of, of your time for God, I have to set priorities. I set priorities into my life. Priorities will help me be focused on the things that are of most importance. And establishing priorities means ranking everything in your life in order of importance while determining which is most important and then focusing on uh, focusing your time and attention and your energies in line with those priorities. So here in your fill in the blank, it says this, being faithful with our time means establishing priorities that we will live by. And so I gave you a little worksheet here that you should actually later on take the time and just look at the different priorities that I, I wrote down there and, and n- number them, one through whatever. And th- you may have some other priorities that you want to write in there. And let me just say this, when you get your priorities and you begin to look through your priorities, then one of the things that you have to do is you have to set goals under each one of those main priorities. So for me, my priorities, let me give them to you. My, my number one priority is God. Oh, you mean even above Pastor Chris? Yes. You know why? Because if my priority is God first and her priority is God first, then I'm going to want to live according to his standards. She's going to want to live according to his standards. That way, these two, when we, when we relate, interrelate and stuff like that, we're going to operate the way that God would have us operate toward one another because I'm obedient to him first and then I serve her second. So God is first. My wife is second. My children are third. And some people go, what? You, you put your children behind your wife? Or, you know, no, that, shouldn't our kids be first? No, 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 no. You know why? My kids are, 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 are third after God and my wife. You know why? Because my kids are going to leave the house. Okay, let me just say that real loud to all three of them here. <laughs> my kids are going to leave the house. And it's going to be me and my wife. And if they leave the house when we're 50-some years old or maybe, you know, around there, okay, that means that we still got quite a few years together, all right? My kids don't take priority over my wife. Next is my calling. See, my calling, what is the, the calling that God has placed on my life to serve him in ministry? That comes after my family. Why? Because... Because if I don't have my family right, my calling is in jeopardy. My family is more important than the calling that God has placed on my life. And let me just say this. My calling is more important than my church. Okay? Because God called us here to this church. And maybe someday, maybe not, but maybe someday he will call us away from the church as well. Therefore, the call that God places on my life is more important than even the church family. So... I hate to tell you this, but you're one, two, three, four, you're five down on the list. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you set up your priority list, yours might look different than mine. It's fine. You know, you might not have a spouse. That's fine. But, but as you set up your priority list under each one of those priorities, you need to think, what are my goals for this priority for this year, this upcoming year? And begin to think about what what goals do I need to establish in order to help that priority stay a a, a good time priority for my life. Like time, there's only so much finance that we have to invest in God's kingdom as well. I must handle God's finance as well. I I want it to be so that there's a surplus that I can use for God's kingdom. And so that involves four things. And on your sheet, it says this, being faithful 
in our treasure means this. And here's the four things that it means. Number one, it means living within our means. It it means living within our means. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. Number two, it means not going into debt, not taking debt out for things that you don't need to impress people who you don't like. Number three, being being, uh, faithful in giving to the church and to missions. Okay? And to the kingdom. Number four, saving money up so that you can have, uh, uh, you can be generous when God prompts you to. So these are, are the four things that we need to do in order to handle our treasure the right way. And on top of our time and our treasure, there's also our talents that God has given to us. And God expects you to discover the gifts and the talents that He has given to you. And to develop them so that you can minister to others for him. If you need help to discover your gifts, if you don't know, like you say, man, I don't, I don't know if I have any talents or gifts. I don't know what my gift is. Then what you should do is take Excel 3 class. The Excel 3 program will help you to discover your gifts and really help you find a, a place where you can serve in the church and you just serve others. And that way you're using your gifts for the things of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, in view of what he's done in my life, I am to offer my bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So what does God really want in regard to stewardship? He wants you. He wants all of you. And in this regard, listen, I want you to understand something. God is stingy, okay? He doesn't want to share you with anything or anyone. We are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. We are the offering. And God is not asking for your calendar, okay? He's not asking for your checkbook. He's not asking. He doesn't need your talents. He's asking, really, he's asking for you. Everything you are. My talents, my checkbook, my time and my calendar, it all goes along with me when I've surrendered my life to God. Paul says that we're to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. We are to surrender everything that we are and everything that we have to God. Our time, our treasures, our talents, our marriages, our children, everything is his. And we're to do this, listen, we do this on a daily basis. Everything. God wants your heart and your soul and your mind and all of your strength, everything. So in reality, stewardship is actually, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And there's three, these three primary areas that we want to be good stewards in our time, on our treasure, and our talents. These are the three primary areas. And most of the stresses over these three areas, it really revolve around the first two, our time and our treasure. We have responsibilities at work, we have responsibilities at school, we have responsibilities at home and church, with our family and with our friends. We got bills to pay, we got appointments to keep and finances to plan. Seeing that most everything we do is dictated by our time or our money, these are two very important issues in our lives. But listen, it's the third area there, our talents, that many of us don't recognize as being a part of stewardship. Fact is, God cares about the stewardship of your gifts and your talents as much as he cares about your stewardship of your finances and of your time. Many people don't think that they have any kind of talent. They don't think that they're, you know, uh, some of us, we look at these guys up here on the platform that are playing and are singing and doing all these great things with instruments, and we think, oh, there's talent. They got talent. Or we see people doing drama like a couple weeks ago when we did the Christmas production, and we go, oh, they've got talent. We see somebody on a computer like Horace and the guys, Kevin, up there, and we go, wow, they got talent in the computers and stuff. But, But I want you to understand something. Every single person God has built within you gifts and talents. There's natural abilities that you have, that every single one of us have. Those natural abilities are God-given, and he wants you and expects you to use those to impact the kingdom of God and, and impact others. You say, you know what, if you're mechanically inclined, I'm mechanically inclined, pastor, how can I use that in the church? Well, it's very simple. You, you know what, let me just tell you something. Last year, I've never been in a church like this before, okay? 
Pastor Chris and I, our last church was in the inner city of, of Boston, okay? We started it with five people. We basically did everything all the time and, and you know, until we built up leaders and we had good leaders and, and stuff like that and there's great leaders continuing to run it. But I remember when something would break down, we were in the middle of a, a funeral, right? In, in the blizzard, wi- blizzard of 2015, we're doing a, a funeral and, and, and the, the, the uh, blizzard literally blew back into the vents and filled up the, the actual heating units, the, the chambers of the heating units, the gas heating units. And we had to, I'm down there thawing them all out and doing all this stuff and trying to get it all done. And there's a funeral going on upstairs. And I'm supposed to ha- help officiate the funeral while I'm melting these, fu- fu- we got these little gas he- or, uh, electric heaters blowing into there and trying to melt it and then trying to get the pilot light started after it's all water and, and stuff. And it was insane. My wife is laughing like crazy. And, and, and then at the same time, we ended up catching this guy who came in with the, with the funeral, all the people who came in from the funeral, and the guy went upstairs, he didn't go into the funeral, but some homeless guy, and he started stealing all the <laughs> sound equipment and stuff. And so we caught him at the same time while I'm doing, anyways. So I, like, I'm, I'm, I'm arresting this guy, you know, I, I got him in the corner, we got him held there, you know, and, and, and stuff, and then we're calling the police, and then we're fixing the heat, and we're doing all this stuff. Last year, last year, let me just tell you what happened here. Last year, I think it was Pastor Gary or some of us, something happened and we heard a hiss. And so somebody went downstairs and saw that the, the, the hot water heater was squirting all over the place. And so I said, oh, I don't know what we're supposed to do. We shut it off. We, we got it so it stopped blowing everywhere. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, like uh, Todd Chambers. Is Todd here? Todd's all the way up there. Todd shows up. He's, and he goes right down there and starts and fixes the whole thing. And I'm like, wait a minute, what happened? You know what I mean? I'm like, dude, what are you, what are you doing? I, and I'm just like, well, I'm supposed to, this is like what I used to have to do, all of this. And it just happened. Why? Because he's got mechanical skills and they're surrendered to Christ. If you're a mechanic, fix somebody's car for Jesus. If you know computers, Fix somebody's computer for Jesus, because if they got Microsoft, it's broken, okay? (laughs) Just saying. Listen, if you're good with kids, we need you in the kids' ministry. God wants to use you in your area of talent. And here's the thing, here's, here's the problem. Some of us, a lot of us, we feel a lot of discontentment in life. And you, you, we wonder what it is. And sometimes we feel discontentment. We think maybe it's because I don't have this or I don't have that or I, I, I need this in my life instead. Oh, maybe I, I need a, a new boyfriend or I need uh, this new car. And, and we have this discontentment. In reality, that discontentment isn't there because of stuff you don't have. It's really there because you haven't been investing in the life of somebody else. When you begin to invest in somebody's life and you begin to see the fruit coming out of their life, man, I'm telling you, that will, that will bring great, great joy. For some of us, we've not managed our time or our treasure well, and so we haven't left ourselves the opportunity to be able to serve God with our talents. We feel like life is nothing more than than like a hamster in a wheel. You ever get that feeling? I've had that feeling before where Sunday comes and I Sunday night and I go home and then Monday morning comes and I go, oh, I got to do it all over again. You know that feeling? And you feel like you're in a hamster in a wheel and you're going boogity, 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 you know? And the hamster going to boogity, 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 boogity. And the only way that the, the, the hamster stops is when he falls out and he lands on his head. Boogity, 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 bam, and he hits the wall. If you manage your time and your treasure faithfully, listen, I want you to understand something. You will have time and you will have finance to be able to use your talents for him. Maybe you're, you're, you're good in this area, you're good in that, so I'm a contractor, I can do this, or I can do that. God wants you to use that for him. 
But if you're not faithful with your finances, you may not have, be able to have the money to go on a missions trip overseas where you're going to be building churches for those that need them. You see what I'm saying? God doesn't just want Sunday mornings, folks. He doesn't just want a portion of your paycheck. God wants you. The time and the money that he asks for in the word are to help us learn. When he, when he says, listen, we talk about the tithe. The tithe is actually an Old Testament standard. Let me just establish that right now. It's an Old Testament standard, okay? So the New Testament doesn't say, well, Jesus actually said, yes, you should tithe, but don't forget mercy and, and grace and justice as well. So I believe in the New Testament that this tithe is really, it's the minimum that we should do for the Lord. My pastor growing up, I'll never forget. I mean, I had just, I was about 20 years old, and I was just, you know that pain when you first start tithing? You know how, you know how that's painful? You go, okay, God, uh, you know, I, okay, I'm going to give you, I made $100 this week, you know, I'm, I'm working during the summer, I'm making $120 this week, and I'm going to give you $12, that's all the gas that I know I'm going to need all week, but here you go, God, you know, and you, you know that pain, right, and I remember giving it to God and starting to be faithful with the Lord, and I was like, okay, God, and I just felt so good, I, I tithed, and pastor got up on a Sunday morning, he goes, and he was preaching, I don't know what he was preaching on, but he, he made a reference in just one of his sermons. He goes, if I was God, I'd change it. The tithe wouldn't be 10%, it would be 30%. I was like, that's $36, God. I don't know, you know, I, it's like I started to panic. Do you know, really the tithe, it's, it's really the minimum of what we should be surrendering to God. Listen, otherwise you'd have to change the hymn book. Think about this, right? You know the song, All to Jesus? I surrender all to him. We'd have to change it. One-tenth to Jesus, I surrender. One-tenth to him, I freely give. Doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work. It just doesn't work. He tells us to give our time and our money and our tithe and our, our, our talents in the word. He tells us why. Because he wants us to learn how to give ourselves to him. That's what it's really about. In the end, money means nothing. In the end, time runs out, folks. We are all that will remain. And we are all that God wants. So our offerings are not about money. And our service isn't about giving a little bit of our time to God. These are the means in which we learn how to devote ourselves to him. So that we can offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Stewardship is really about putting yourself in the offering plate. You are the offering that God really wants, but are you willing to give yourself up? If you've surrendered your life to God, then you, you know that you are not your own. You belong to Jesus. You're owned by him. If you're a follower of Jesus, then you are called to be a steward of the resources that he's put into your care. So stewardship really takes obedience. It requires obedience. Believers who want to be good stewards understand the concept of, of obedience. We understand that we are servants of Jesus. That means we're at his beck and call. That means that, that for him, he is Lord. He's over us. He's in charge 100%. So in reality, stewardship is a lordship issue. It's a lordship issue. I think that's one of the bottom fill in the blank there. Stewardship is a lordship issue. This is hard for a lot of us because as American Christians, listen, we don't want somebody telling us what we're supposed to do, even if it's the word, okay? We would rather buy God off sometimes than get active for him. That's why we have so many televangelists. Think about the message that they preach. Their message is, you know, whatever you want, whatever you desire, whatever you dream, whatever your heart longs for, Jesus is going to give it to you as long as you send a donation, as long as you put a seed here or there. And what has happened is we've, we've literally inverted Christianity. Instead of us being the servants and him being the Lord, we've made us become Lord and he's like our slave. God, maybe you can be the candy man for me. That wasn't Jesus' message at all, was it? In John chapter 14, verse 15, he said this, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Jesus is Lord, and I'm his slave. He commands, and I obey. 
And stewardship expresses absolute subjection and devotion to the Lord Jesus. If I'm going to live for him, it has to be 100%. I can't serve him halfway, folks. True stewardship says this, get this. I am his. Everything I own is his. And if I'm obedient to him and I use my resources in accordance with God's will and his standards, he will take care of my needs. There was a father and a son traveling on a freeway, and the boy said to his father, said, Daddy, I'm so hungry. Can we stop for a snack? And just as they're going down the highway, they saw uh, the rest area come up and the golden arches were there. And so he pulled off into the rest area and they went in uh, and he, the father uh, had his little boy sit down at one of the tables and the father went to the counter and he, when he came back, he came back with a bag full of steamy fresh french fries, McDonald's french fries. The boy's face brightened and it, with delight. And he was really hungry, and he started, the father put the fries before him, the boy started to, to eat the fries, and the father sat down opposite of him. His, he loved his son, and he loved to watch him, you know, eating those fries. And the two of them sat at the table a while, and, and the boy was munching away on the snack. And then the dad did what most of us dads would have done. He reached over to take a fry for himself. The little boy snapped his father's hand and said, Dad, these are mine. Why didn't you get some for yourself? And the dad thought about the inc incident on the long, silent ride home. He thought to himself, he thought, I gave my son every fry he had. And all I wanted was one. My son doesn't understand something. See, he doesn't understand he doesn't know that I could take all those fries away in an instant. Or if I felt like it was best for him, I could have added even more fries to that bag and given him such abundance that he'd be overwhelmed by them. He thinks that they're his. How did he forget who bought them and who they really belong to? In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, Jesus tells the parable of the talents. And in closing, I just want to read this story and just give you a couple insights from this story. And it's not going to be on the screen, folks. I'm just going to, I'm reading it right out of my Bible. You can turn there if you want. Matthew chapter 25, verse, starting in verse 14. And it says this. Again, he's talking about the kingdom of God. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who uh, called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, and to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Now the talents here, he's not talking about our, our earthly talents and gifts like what we were talking about. He's talking about actually a, a sum of money, a financial sum of money. Um, each according to his ability. And when he had gone on his journey, then he went on his journey. And the man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned to settle accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought five, the five others. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. Watch this. Verse 21. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a, few, in a few things, and I will give you charge over many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The first thing I want you to see here, this first thing that sticks out in my mind, is that our faithfulness makes God happy. He says, come and share in your master's happiness. When we're faithful to God, it makes God happy. Let's keep reading. The man with two talents came and said, Master, he said, you've entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. And his master replied and said, well done, you good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. The second thing I want you to see is that our reward for good work is more work. Right? Think about that. You know, you go, I want to be faithful to God. I want to do things good for God. 
The, the master said, you've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to give you even more things to take care of. Your reward for good work <laughs> is more work. Doesn't make sense, does it? Wouldn't it be nice just to have a vacation? You know, that's it. I want you to know something. I'm not going to say it. Okay, let me keep going. Verse 24. Then the man who had received one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. So here is what belongs to you. The master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. So when I returned, I would have at least received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more and, and uh, will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, uh, it will take, be taken away from him. And then th he goes on, he says, throw that worthless servant into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The last thing I want you to see, the last thing that strikes me is that poor stewardship offends God. Poor stewardship offends God. Why? Because God expects increase, folks. You know, every, every other year, last year we started, a sermon, we started the year with a sermon series on prayer. And this year we start the sermon series on uh, the year with a sermon series on, on stewardship. And I want you to know that next year we'll start a, this, the year with a sermon series on prayer. And the year after that we'll start a sermon series on stewardship. You know why? Because really these are the two most important things that you can do as a believer of Jesus Christ. You can learn how to pray and you can learn how to steward the resources that are given to you. Someday there's going to be an accounting. And I want, I want the account that I have in heaven, I want it to look right. I want the time that I've had on earth to reflect the priorities of God. I want the treasure that he has given to me on earth I want it to be invested in the things that will return fruit for the kingdom of God. And, and the talents that I have, the talents that, I've, I, that he's given to me, I want to use them to increase the kingdom of God and impact people's lives for him. I believe that's your heart too. Let's stand as we close. Thank you for taking the time to watch this teaching video today. If this video has impacted you, we would love to know what God is doing in your life. You can get a hold of us by going online at www.victory-ag.com and you'll notice a link there right on the home page that says, I need prayer. You can click that link and it'll take you to a little prayer page and you fill out the information and whether it's a, a prayer request that you have or whether it's a praise report of something that God has done and maybe something he spoke to you from this sermon, please send that to us and we'll be praying for you. And again, if you uh, live in the area, we want to encourage you to come and be our guest at Victory Church in Sharon. God bless you.